Very good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to Breaking Myths series. Today is uh, series number eight, which is hosted by BGF and uh, is being cross-broadcasted cross with uh, 12 other Buddhist associations. So <clears throat> let's begin with a short Buddha Puja before we invite Dr. Wong to <clears throat> uh, deliver his uh, talk. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sankhang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi sankhang saranang gachami, Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi sankhang saranang gachami. The five precepts. Panati pata veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adina dana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kame su michachara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musavada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Surame raya maja pamadatana. Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Ami. The five ennobling virtues. With deeds of love and compassion, I purify my action. With selfless giving, I purify my action. With moderation and contentment, I purify my action. With truthful words, I purify my speech. With clear mindfulness and calmness, I purify my thought. Sabe Sata Uti Honuto. Things be happy. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, tonight we are, Dr. Wong will be sharing with us from his uh, new book, Breaking Myths. Today is series number eight, chapter number eight. The title is Sneaking Away in the Middle of the Night. Let me give a short introduction for Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong graduated from the University of Malaya and was visiting lecturer at Alma Mater in 1988 and 1989. He joined Monash University, Malaysia from February 2007 to form the pioneer faculty of the clinical school in Johor Bahru. Dr. Wong is working as a physician and teaching medical students and doctors in Johor Bahru since 1990. He has been sharing the Dhamma regularly in Johor Bahru, Singapore, Jakarta, Bangkok and Manila, and Malacca and uh, all parts of Malaysia for the past one and a half decades. Dr. Wong was also an invited speaker at the third, seventh and eighth global conferences on Buddhism. He teaches a weekly Dharma class at Meta Lodge Buddhist Center in Johor Bahru since 2004. So Dr. Wong recently launched his second book, Breaking Myths, from which we are now uh, going to hear chapter number eight. And uh, today's talk is cross broadcasted to 12 other Buddhist associations. So with this, okay, after the talk or during the talk, if you have any questions to post from the Facebook viewers, kindly write your questions, preface with a Q, followed by your question in your Facebook from your respective organizations. And then uh, 
it will be copied and pasted into the Zoom chat here where Dr. Wong will pick up the questions. Okay, so over to you, Dr. Wong. Namo Buddhaya, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Good evening to everyone. And thank you for hosting this eight sharing in this series of Breaking Myths. Today, we are going to talk about something which most people do not like to talk about. As Brother Huachai said, Wong Yinon is brave enough to say it, or foolish enough to say it. But today we are going to look at the life of our teacher, the Lord Buddha, and try and tease apart the historical man who taught us the Dhamma from the man that is created by legends, in legends and tales by people who lived hundreds of years after him. Now, this is a very important letter that I would like to share with you. The person who wrote this letter is a very highly educated man, holding a doctorate and the manager of an MNC company before he retired. And he sent this letter to me some years ago, in which he said that when he was a nominal Buddhist, I followed my Buddhist wife on the pilgrimage in India which so many of us in now would have similarly gone. And during the visit, I was so disillusioned by the many tales of miraculous exploits of Buddha that I gave up on Buddhism completely. Thankfully, this gentleman did find back the Dhamma later on in his spiritual search and we remain good friends. And he's a very good supporter of my work but he wrote to me appealing to all Dhamma teachers to teach what the Buddha taught and not dwell on the imagined miracles so beloved of storytellers. Now I would like to bring us all back to our childhood. When you and I were children, and I'm sure so did my children and your children, we were all fed a diet of many tales about the Buddha which we in our innocence accepted as true. And some might have felt it incredulous and walked away, while others in an era whereby people are less questioning would have accepted it. But today is a different generation. My medical students, for example, are all taught not to accept anything unless it is evidence-based, what we call evidence-based medicine. Any person's individual opinion means nothing. Everything has to be backed by evidence, by rational thoughts, by reality. And so I did discuss this with some other Dhamma teachers. And while some said, well, well, let's just let it be, you know, they are all meant to have a moral lesson behind but it grown on me that it, this becoming actually a hindrance because it is creating doubts. And doubts, as you know, is one of the five emotional hindrances. Now, we read the suttas, we read the vinayas, we read the biographies, and we read from these books, we must discern what is fact what is legend? What is symbolism or allegory and metaphors? Because this would avoid confusion and allow us to have a better understanding of the Buddha and his teachings. Because over 2,600 years, devout disciples had embellished even simple facts with fantastic elements that they imagined befitting a great being. While in their time, it may well have served the purpose of keeping people interested. It may well have served the purpose of trying to promote the Buddha as a great religious figure, 
Today, it might be a hindrance because the audience is no longer as receptive and naive as those days. But to tease apart the Buddha of history from the Buddha of stories and legends is not easy for all these are deeply entrenched within our common consciousness. Today's sharing, I will try and just pick up a few examples of what is commonly known and what we can use to illustrate this point that I'm making. Here I pay respect to a few people who had taught me a lot along this quest, people of similar thoughts. And one of course is the late brother T. Y. Lee and presently uh, Professor Wong, Professor Wong at the National Uni of Singapore, Ming Fai, and of course Sister Sylvia Bay, whose seminal work on In Between the Lines tells us a lot. Now, much of what we know and love and think as truth are the biographies like the Buddha Charita, the Mahavastu, the Lalita Vistara, the Nidana Kata, all of which were written hundreds of years after the Parinibbana of the Buddha. The Buddha Charita is available online free. You can actually get the entire book free. And it's the earliest full biography of the Buddha and it's unreservedly mythical. Many of the popular stories are from the Buddha Charita. Now there are many, many good reasons to doubt the miraculous legends. But one thing is clear, whether it is in the Nikayas or in these legends, the common theme of birth, maturity, renunciation, search, awakening, liberation, teaching and death runs through. And this is probably the simple reality and the truth. Well, let us now try and demystologize the legends and see the historical Buddha. Now the earlier strata of texts are found in what I've listed here. And among the earliest would probably be the Dhammapada, the Sutta Nipata, the Udana, the Itiwutaka. Because here you will see lines taken of sayings by the Buddha with very little narration and editing. And as you go from Anguttara Nikaya to Samyutta to Majima to Diga, you will find more and more narration, more and more editing being put in. But nevertheless, these 12 that I've listed are among the earlier strata of text. And I would refer to these texts in my sharing as the canonical text. Now we know the place of the Buddha's birth and childhood, thanks to the Emperor Asoka, who visited this place and put a stone column marking the place. And we know that the Sakyan clansmen dwelt along the Rohini River at the southern foothills of the Himalayas. Now the legends tell us that the Buddha's father was a king, Suddhodana Gautama, with his capital at Kapila Vastu. Now I say the legends tell us this because historically that place was a republic with an elected leader. It is not a kingdom. And the father Sudodana was not as later legend would put it to be a king. If you look at the Nikayas, you will see nowhere is it stated that the Buddha was a prince and his father a king. What is familiar to all of you is that the Buddha is from the warrior caste, the Kastriya caste. I am sure it would have struck a bell among many of you. Why is he not from royalty, but from a warrior caste? The people who settled there were fierce warriors and they became a republic with a self-governing 
structure, but they were a Vasa state of the kingdom of Kosala. In fact, in the Nikayas, this was clearly stated. King Pasanadi of Kosala, the kingdom of Kosala to the west was their overlord. And they had to pay taxes and tribute to Kosala in return for semi-autonomous rule. Sudodana was the local elected Raja, like a chief minister in Malaysia. And he is answerable to the big man, the Maharaja in Kosala. And as I said, nowhere in the Buddha's talks was his father described as a king. This is actually consistent with history. It is only the legends later who made his father a king and him a prince. Now the ancient legal texts are clear that the warriors were forbidden to give up military life and to take up a life of ascetism. This is what the Buddha did at the age of 29. If you can understand this, you will understand better how traumatic it must have been for his family when he renounced all this. For the Kastriya, there is no other rule but to fight. You, of course, are familiar with the legends of how he was trained to be a warrior and how he was a fine warrior, for example. And the court of the Kastriya required the soldier to die gloriously in battle. Everyone was trained in warfare and cowardice was punishable by death. Hence, when we understand this, then you understand that a 29-year-old trained warrior to be shot by an encounter with a sick old man or a corpse is actually hardly credible. Now, many of you are familiar with the legends in the Jataka tales, and they tell of a fantastic conception, Maya's dream. You see this in Burobudo, you see this in many paintings in our local centers. You go to the Thai temples, Burmese temples, you see paintings like this everywhere. But I hope you realize that this is a common theme among religious figures all over the world. There are many, many religious all over the world who had fantastic conceptions. I will not go on to name them, but the people of that era looked at sexual intercourse as mundane, as not befitting a great being. And hence many religious figures and miraculous conceptions not involving sexual intercourse. And in our Buddhist legends, not in the Nikayas, but in the legends, Maya had a strange dream in which she saw a white elephant entering her womb and she became pregnant, implying a non-sexual conception befitting a great being, the sexual act being viewed as low and vulgar by the populace. Now, while this may be acceptable to even my generation when we were young, we just swallow it, lock, stock, and barrel. Telling this to a child today might have a big laugh as a response. Because with the availability of the internet, with the availability of instant information for children, this is no longer not even entertaining, but ridiculous. As I said, this is only in the legends not in the canon. He was named Siddhartha. And many of you here are familiar with this word Siddhartha Gautama. But very few among you all would know that nowhere in the canon is it mentioned that his name is Siddhartha. None. The canon is similarly silent about the time of the Buddha's birth. So these addition of a personal name, addition of Vesa, were things which occurred later on as people wrote a biography for their previous leader. Many of you would have been to Lumbini Gardens. You would have seen the Asokan pillar. Now the Buddha is a historical figure that we are quite confident because Asoka lived 
200 years after the Buddha. And in the Asokan pillars, the Buddha is mentioned about five times and the word Dhamma about 100 times. This is important information for us. Now my received mail from this same brother reads, very often the introduction of Buddhism starts with the birth of Prince Siddhartha and that at birth he walked seven steps and then proclaimed that it was going to be his last rebirth. To believe this would require as much blind faith as needed to believe of a virgin birth. And this is in the canon. This is in the Nikayas. So the miraculous birth of the Buddha had puzzled scholars for hundreds of years. Well, while some are content to believe the myth and have no desire to look further, many modern people think that this story is purely symbolic. A story that once inspired people with a Steven Spielberg effect, but today, very confusing. It is likely a later addition, symbolically telling the, that the Bodhisatta had already successfully cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment in his past life. And we are all familiar with what he was supposed to have said. Even the early narrators, they could not resist, but use miracles and magic to impress. This was in the Majima Nikaya. So this has much more narration than Sutta Nipata or Dhammapada or Udaka or Itiwutaka or Udana. Now, while the Buddha had clearly indicated that such things are unnecessary, even the early narrators could not resist but use miracles and magic to impress. And as I said, while it may have served a purpose in the past, today we have to be very careful because any student who challenges a teacher would make the teacher lose credibility. Let's take another example. Again, a story in which we are all familiar with. After the baby was born, a sitta, a renowned ascetic, came, visited the child, examined the child. Well, by itself, that is nothing unusual. Even today, people do that. Bring some holy man to look at the baby, bless the baby, maybe even give him a name or something. But this visit by Asita again illustrates an important point. How with time things become embellished. Now, the hermit was shown the child. And this is what we are familiar with in the legends what we swallowed when we were children. In the legends, Asita is supposed to have said, this prince, if he remains in the palace, when grown up will become a great king and subjugate the whole world. But if he forsakes the court life to embrace a religious life, he will become a Buddha, the savior of the world. So here you have a dichotomy, two things. But the suttas tell a very much less dramatic story. The Nikayas tells us that Asita went to Kapila Vastu, warmly welcome. He examined the baby and proclaimed that this baby would attain complete enlightenment, reach the ultimate purified vision and proclaim the truth out of compassion of the many. Then tears welled up in his eyes. The Sakyan asked if he had foreseen some misfortune but he replied that he was sad because he would surely die before all this happened. Full stop. No dichotomy, no either or, no drama. Now people like drama. And the narrators later on who wrote the biographies added in lots of drama. So as I said, it is common to invite the holy man. It is also typical for the holy man to predict Okay, but the either all was not in the canon, only in the legends. Now the legends similarly say that Sudodana was increasingly worried as he recalled 
Asita's prophecy and tried to distract the prince to turn his thoughts. Apparently, no old or sick people were allowed to be seen by the prince. Even dead leaves had to be removed. And that's because the king was worried that if the prince is to see this, he would realize life, death, and then renounce. Now, of course, when we look at this logically today, it is quite difficult to imagine how somebody could not have seen old or sick people. Even he would have seen his parents go old, he himself age, etc. Surely he would have got a flu or something. So as we said, that while these are very useful in the old days of ways in which a religious figure is seen to be somebody who gone through all this, he is glorified, but today it may prove a hindrance. Now the reality, if you look at the Nikayas, is that the Buddha obviously was aware of what is aging and impermanence. And he said, when an untaught run of the mill person, himself subject to aging, not beyond aging, sees another who is aged, he is horrified, humiliated and disgusted, oblivious to himself that he too is subject to aging, not beyond aging. If I, who am subject to aging, not beyond aging, were to be horrified, humiliated, and disgusted on seeing another person who is aged, that would not be fitting for me. And he described these thoughts occurring to him when he was still a bodhisattva. So it is obvious that if you look at Anguttara Nikaya here, the bodhisattva was well aware of aging. Now, this is something which all of us are familiar with. I don't think there's a single person in this audience who is not familiar with the story of the four sights. That one day he went out and he saw the four sights, an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a monk. Now, of course, logically it's again quite inconceivable that an intelligent man and a warrior at that trained in the arts of killing is unaware of sickness, aging, and death. But even besides the point, this is not in the suttas, but in the Buddha Wamsa and the Nidana Kata. In the sutta itself, in the Mahapadana Sutta, in the Digha Nikaya, the Buddha described these four sides, but not of him. It was with relation to a past Buddha Vipassi. Now, the living home on spiritual quest was an established part of Indian culture of that time. It's like you and I going on a research quest and an expedition to find something. And it was very much in the tradition and culture of the people of that time. Leaving home, something that non-Buddhists had asked me many a times. And again, we are familiar with the legend of how in the middle of the night he stole away, barely beyond stealing a glance at the wife and the newborn child, and then walking away. But this is in the legends. These are not in the suttas. In Majima Nikaya 26, it is clearly stated, so at a later time, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessings of youth in the first stage of life, and while my parents, unwilling, were crying with tears streaming down their faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the orca robe, and went forth from home life into homelessness. Now, I had often wondered, why do our children Dharma class not teach this, which is in the Majima Nikaya, but instead teach that very nice story of someone running away from home in the middle of the night with guards who mysteriously fall asleep and gates that mysteriously open. Well, I suppose Steven Spielberg effects are much more exciting, captivating than what is actually recorded in the Nikayas, which is actually quite mundane. Parents crying, 
streaming down their face, the tears streaming down their face because the child is going to go on to an uncertain future of suffering. Something very mundane, very common. But yet as serious Buddhists, we should be aware that this is what is actually in the canon. Now he went to the land of Maganda and practiced ascetism. And sometimes we look at these ascetics not in a very good light, but actually these ascetics were very, very intelligent people. They were people who actually rejected the religious orders of that day, the Vedas, the Brahminical practices. They were the original free thinkers searching for enlightenment by themselves outside the traditional schools of belief. And this is what the Bodhisattva did. That's why he joined them because he has rejected what was the norm, what was the standard and search for himself. He was an original free thinker. We are also familiar this, with this story of how Sujata went and offered to the Bodhisattva food on the night where he became enlightened. We are familiar with this lovely story of how she mistaken him for a tree deva and gave him milk porridge. Now this story is from the Patha Ma Sambodhi, which is a legend written much, much later, only now available in Burmese and Thai. The other interesting one is the physical battle. Every time we look at any movie or cartoon or comic made about the Buddha, we see this battle being fought. It's very exciting. I still remember Kino Reeves version and we see the battle being fought. Now is this Mara physical or in our minds? Are there hints in the Nikayas? Mara appeared with a thousand arms on each side, etc., etc., holding all kinds of weapons. But the future Buddha won a peaceful victory over Mara with the power of loving kindness. Loving kindness in his mind, not a physical fight. This suggests that this fight was actually a metaphor for a mental struggle in his mind and not a physical fight. Mara's armies are likely an allegorical account. Mara represents the defilements within all of us. Our greed, anger, lust, restlessness, guilt, doubt, which opposes the peace, mindfulness, clarity that leads to the knowledge of the truth. And before the Bodhisattva was enlightened, he still had such defilements but he had to defeat them with his determination and the great virtues he had accumulated. Now I know I must be shaking, shaking many cars in concrete beliefs, cast in stone ideas, but these are the realities that I would like to share. We also read about the three daughters of Mara. Is it real event in terms of a physical encounter or mental? Well, the names of the three daughters are amazingly educational. And what are the names of the three daughters? Tanha, Raga, Aradi. Craving, desire, lust, jealousy, aversion, or hatred. Amazing names. And that the Buddha showed no reaction whatsoever does it suggest to us in this metaphor that the Buddha was utterly removed from all these defilements? Again, a metaphor for a mental struggle. So again, as I said that while yes, it does provide a moral lesson behind the story, we have to keep in mind that it is a story. This is another interesting event, well beloved of movies again, about how in the sixth week there was a train storm and a big huge naga by the name of Mukalinda coiled itself round, opened the hood and shielded the Buddha. Now, I hope you are aware that Mukalinda 
is the name of a tree. The Mukalinda tree bearing Tonia Akutangula is a tree that is common in India, in dam places, on river banks and lakes. Big tree with shade. And while even the Mahavaga from the Vinaya talks about a Naga king, it is very likely that Mukalinda is just a tree. And what more from the legends, it grew from one head to become seven heads. Then we are familiar with the first sermon, wonderful teachings. And when the teachings came to an end, Kondana attained stream entry. Seeing Kondana attain this fruit as a result of listening to the teaching, the Buddha joyously uttered, oh, Kandana has realized, Kandana has attained the truth. And the other four in time attained enlightenment and became monks too, like Kandana. I put this in because a brother wrote to me and asked, is it possible for a lay person to attain some level of awakening? Here we have Kandana, an ascetic, he was not a monk when he became a Sotopan, he was an ascetic. And he listened to the Dhamma as taught by the Buddha and he became the first to understand the Dhamma and accept it, becoming a Sotopan. But more to answer the brother's question is that the other person after this that the Buddha spoke to and taught was a lay person called Yasa. This is from the Mahavaga, the Vinaya. Yasa is a lay person, not a monk, not an ascetic, the son of a rich man. And it is important for the brother who asked me this question that the Buddhist teachings does not see lay followers as second rate Buddhists. Yes, on account of his social and family ties, the householder will find it much more difficult than a renounced person, a monk, to gain inner detachment and release. But it is possible. And the canon lists at least 21 householders who became arahants without ever being monks. Now let's take a look at the Buddha's visit to Kapila Vastu, Bali Kampung. And the reality is that he was rejected by his own relatives, not surprisingly. And the reason was the Buddha at the time was only about 36 years old. He was relatively young compared to his relatives who probably saw him running around playing as a child. And like in all Asian cultures, age is valued. And they saw themselves as much higher standing than this man this young man with big claims. And not surprisingly at all, they did not make any gesture of respect. In fact, they probably felt that it had to be the other way around. And it was only the younger Sakyan princes and princesses, as the legend says, who sat in the front row and paid respect. And here in the legends was another miracle that we are familiar with of the Buddha flying in the air and then fire and water coming out. And all the relatives being humbled by this event paid respect. So the application of miracles is actually a common strategy by religious authors to claim superiority over others. But the Buddha himself condemned such actions. Despite this, many miracles became part of accepted Buddhist mythology. Now the Buddha clearly rejected any magic shows. There was a man called Kavata, and he said to the Buddha that, well, would it not be good if the blessed one appointed a monk to work a marvel of supernormal power so that the people of Nalanda might become more confident in the blessed one? And the Buddha replied, I do not teach the law to monks in that way. The Buddha gave us three kinds of magic or miracles. 
One is described as the supernormal power to do all kinds of supernormal things. And second, supernormal powers, reading other people's mind. But he only allowed and accepted the third as a genuine miracle, the supernormal power to guide people according to mental development for their own good and using suitable methods to fit these people. In other words, it is only the miracle of instruction, the miracle that someone could become a good person despite whatever his past was. That is the miracle of education, of cultivation, which the Buddha accepted. In the Vinaya, the Buddha specifically disallowed the Sangha from performing miracles. And the clearest statement of the Buddha's opposition to magical power and supernatural abilities is again found in the Kevata Sutta. I dislike, reject, and despise them, the Buddha said. Now, I hope all of us brothers and sisters here realize that with the Buddha stating such 2,600 years ago, he would have placed himself in direct opposition to much of popular religious traditions, which even today focus on supernatural powers and miracles as a means of measuring worthiness or spiritual attainment or the greatness of the performer. Now, Ananda posed a very interesting question. Ananda actually asked the Buddha whether he has supernatural powers. Now, this is a very important question because Ananda was supposed to be the Buddha's personal attendant for 20 over years. And he had to ask the Buddha. And the Buddha replied that when he concentrates his mind, he is capable of such powers. The point is that Ananda had to ask whether the Buddha had such capabilities. Obviously, he did not witness it in line with the Buddha's prohibition. Now we are all familiar with the story of Yasudhara, the Buddha's wife. How they got married at the age of 16, etc., etc. Now we are also familiar with the Buddha's first visit after enlightenment back to Kapila Vastu and Yasodhara asking Rahula to approach the Buddha and ask for his inheritance. These are among the many stories which form part of our diet. Now, what most people don't know is that Yasodhara is not even mentioned by name anywhere in the canon. And that none of the stories that we are so familiar with, except the last one, whereby she told Rahula to approach the Buddha and ask for his inheritance. None of these stories appear in the canon. And even in that story, Rahula Mata, or Rahula's mother, was what she was addressed, not Yasodhara. The name Yasodhara came only in the biographies and the legends. In reality, the Buddha was a humble, wandering teacher. Do we have evidence that he was a humble, wandering teacher, going from village to village, town to town to teach? There's a lot of evidence in the canon. For 45 years after his enlightenment, he went around Northeast India, teaching and persuading people to follow a noble way of life. In this process, he was welcomed and accepted by many, but he was also scorned and rejected by others. He was even abused by those who don't like him. In the Dhammapada, he said, I am like an elephant in battle, enduring an arrow shot from a bow, will endure a false accusation, for the mass of people have no principles. And in another place, 
the people in that particular village even blocked the well so that the Buddha and his entourage could not get water and had to leave. And once the people of Tuna in the Mala Republic even blocked the well to dissuade the Buddha and the whole shaven headed bunch of Samaras, Samanas, from slaking their thirst and stopping there. So he was certainly a teacher walking from village to village, town to town, very much like so many other teachers of that time. Some teachers are welcome, others are not. And if you read the Kalama Sutta, you will realize that there are many, many teachers like the Buddha who pass the place where the Kalamas were staying. And the Buddha was one among them, but with a good reputation. And hence, the Kalamas asked for his opinion. Now, how did the Buddha look like? If I say that he was an itinerant teacher walking from village to village, how did he look like? Did he look like anything that we have in our imagery, our statues, our porcelain and our brass images? If we look at the canon, at the Nikayas, it is clear that the Buddha is shaven headed, just like any of his other monks. He followed the Vinaya. He was also called Botak, bald, patted recluse by someone who didn't like him too much. And he looked like any other monk. In the Samana Pala Sutta, King Ajata Satu was brought by Dr. Jivaka to see the Buddha who was sitting among all his monks meditating. Now, when King Ajata Satu arrived there, he could not tell who among all these monks that are seated is the Buddha. And he had to ask Ajata Satu, who is the Buddha among all these? And Mahakashapa is said to have a strong resemblance to the Buddha. And the Buddha's cousin Nanda is often mistaken for the Buddha from a distance. So he would have very much looked like any other monk walking from village to village, town to town. And this is another very interesting sutta in which there is a conversation between the venerable Pukusati, who was a devout student of the Buddha Dharma, but who had never met the Buddha. He learned it from the other disciples. And Pukusati made it his mission that he's going to walk all the way to meet the Buddha who is reputedly at a certain place now. And coincidentally, Pukusati rested for the night in a cow shed. And the Buddha who was also walking also asked for permission to spend the night in the cow shed. And so the two of them, Pukusati and the Buddha, were together in the cow shed resting for the night. And the conversation struck between these two, documented in Majima Nikaya 140. And Pukusati spent a long time discussing with the Buddha about what he has learned. And he told this man that the Blessed One is my teacher. It is that of the Blessed One's Dhamma that I approve. And the Buddha asked Pukusati, where monk is the Blessed One staying now? Have you ever seen that Blessed One before? On seeing him, would you recognize him? And Pukusati replied, no, my friend, I have never seen the Blessed One before nor on seeing him, would I recognize him? And now Pukusati is right in front of the Buddha. And yet he could see the Buddha as just another monk. And of course, subsequently he began to realize that this monk knew too much. And then the conversation went on whereby the Buddha actually told Pukusati, I am the teacher, the blessed one that you are looking for. But the important message we get from this is that Pukusati could not tell apart the Buddha from any other monk. So while we have such beloved icons, the Chinese will have the Chinese imagery, usually a fatter man. The Burmese have their Burmese ones with very long years, the Sri Lankan ones, and then the Thai ones, each with their individual characteristics. And of course, the Gandharan ones, whereby he looked more like Apollo 
because he was based on Apollo when the Gandharan Buddha images were first made. But honestly, he would have looked just like any other monk. And I particularly like these two images. If you look at Dika Nikaya, you will see one sutta called the Lakana Sutta, whereby it describes the 32 marks of a great man. And these were really out of the world physical characteristics. If someone is to look even a little bit like these 32 marks, that man would certainly have looked like an alien, not a human being. These characteristics or marks of a great man were already in the consciousness of the Indian culture of that time. And it's very, very likely that when they wrote these narrations, the physical imagery of the Buddha was remade to fit into these marks of a great man expected by the culture of that time. If you are to take a look at the 32 features, he would certainly not look like a human being, but like that of an alien. Now, if somebody is to look like that, would anyone dare harm him? For example, Devadatta, who challenged him, who demanded things, and even attempted to throw rocks at the Buddha in an attempt to kill him. If someone looks like an alien, I doubt anybody would dare to do that. If somebody looks like an alien with hellos, etc., etc., I doubt any villager would dare to seal the well. Now I ask you, Dhamma brothers and sisters, is this the Buddha? No, this is not the Buddha. I took this photo in the Brit from the British Museum when I visited, and this is the image of Mahavira a contemporary of the Buddha. This is the image of Mahavira, and you will see remarkable similarities other than the fact that the images of Mahavira inevitably will show a completely nude person because they do not wear any gowns or robes. But other than that, if you look, there are many features that you will see in the Buddha's image as we expect today. And this is very likely because this was the iconography or the common consciousness of how a man who is very wise or enlightened would look like. Now the Buddha falls ill too, just like all of us as we age. And you all are aware of course that the physician Jivaka was his doctor who had to treat him with all kinds of things that was available. Many of you are familiar with the quarrel at Kosambi. Two groups of Hmong in Kosambi quarreled. And they quarreled so badly that the Buddha had to walk to Kosambi to try and talk sense into these two groups. But of course you are familiar what happened. They, dis they did not listen to the Buddha. They refused to listen to the Buddha and I doubt you would dare do that to someone who can have fire and water coming out of him. But you would dare do that to a teacher, your teacher. So the Buddha went to Kosambi and failed. And as you know, he left and spent the Vasa on his own. And these two groups of quarreling monks only agreed to make up their difference, not because of the Buddha, but because the local lay people refused to make any more food offerings to them. And how long do you think the quarrel lasted before hungry stomachs, not wisdom, woke them up? They quarreled for 18 months before reconciliation due to hungry stomachs. Now from the 60th year of his life, the Buddha's health deteriorated as would be expected. Now having walked huge distances his joints must have been in very bad state. And yes, you will see even in the Nikaya's description of the Buddha suffering from back pain, worse with standing. And at Kapila was too, he had to sit with his back leaning on a pillar. 
And even then it gave him so much pain, he had to lie down and ask Ananda to continue giving the Dhamma talk. And in another sutta, it described how he had to sit with his bare back to the sun so that the warmth of the sun's rays would provide physical comfort. Old age and disease, it affected the Buddha. And the 45th rains retreat of Vesali was the last rains retreat where he became very seriously ill. And here in his own words, he said, I am frail, old, aged, far gone in years. This is my 80th year and my life is spent. Even as an old cart, Ananda is held together with much difficulty. So the body of the Tathagata is kept going only with supports. It is Ananda only when the Tathagata disregarding external objects and going into a meditative state that his body becomes comfortable. Now these are the last words as you are familiar. Be islands unto yourself, refuges unto yourself, seeking no external refuge. With the Dhamma as your island, the Dhamma as your refuge, seeking no other refuge. Now today is the eve of Deepavali and it is very interesting. I was in India on pilgrimage and it happened to be Deepavali. You know the word Deepa could mean light, could mean island. So this sentence where the word island is, is Deepa. So be a light unto yourself or be an island unto yourself or with the Dhamma as your light with the Dhamma as your island, two possible interpretations. And these are striking and inspiring because it is vital to us to recognize that the message there tells us it is self-exertion. It is superficial and futile to seek redemption through an external savior or to hope for an afterlife with prayers and offerings in a heaven or whatever you're thinking of. To the Buddha, all these were fruitless and meaningless. Ananda, these sala trees burst into flower out of season in homage to the Dattakata and covered his body. And I showed you the picture here. These are sala flowers. In Hanoi, sorry, in Ho Chi Minh City, there are many, many temples with beautiful sala trees. And when I was there, it was in season. So I took this photo. They put them in the monasteries. But the monk or the nun, the lay person or the lay man or the lay woman who lives his life practicing the Dhamma properly and perfectly, he or she is the one who is honoring, revering and respecting the, Dhamma, the Tathagata with the highest homage, not with the external offerings of light, candle, flower, etc., etc. The highest offering the Buddha repeatedly tells us is our own transformation. The priceless legacy of the Buddha is the miracle of education. The only miracle that he accepts, that he did not condemn, knowing the truth, practicing and cultivating morality and mental stillness with resultant transformation of the mundane to the noble as a means of liberation from Dukkha. Now the important symbol of the Buddha is not the image, not an image with curly hair or an image with long ears or an image with a pointed tip at the top. All those are cultural, what people expected of that Buddha. As I said, Buddhist images by Chinese artists would generally imagine him to be much fatter than a Thai image. The most important image, and for 500 years, the image which represented the Buddha is the footprints of the Buddha. We are to follow the path that he left for us, literally his footprint. So do not be too obsessed with whether your Buddha image at home is fat or thin, standing or sitting, or sitting cross-legged, 
whether he has hair, no hair, whether his ear touches his shoulder, etc., etc. All those are cultural. All those are part of the 32 marks in the Indian culture of that time. The Buddha was a human being. As a human, he was born. As a Buddha, he lived. And as a Buddha, his life came to an end. But although human, he became a Mahapurisa, an extraordinary man. So can you and I. The Buddhism is not about books, not about chanting or rites or rituals. Buddhism is the practice by, by way of body, speech, and mind that completely destroys defilements, in part at least, or completely. Thank you, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. This sharing only illustrates with a few examples. There are much, much more, which is not within the scope of a one hour sharing that I can offer. And the material that I shared is collated from many sources. I repeat, among them, Professor Wong Wing Fai, a good friend of mine in Singapore, Sister Sylvia Bay, whose seminar work Between the Lines is available or free for all of you to read, and the late brother T. Wiley. They had all helped me with understanding much of what I shared with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, and back to Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for the very, uh, very frank, very scientific uh, approach to the Buddha's life and the, the debunking a lot of myths. Dr. Wong, at the moment, there are three questions. Let me feel the first one. Question from Jeanette Ang. How about the devas who asked the Buddha to stay to teach because he thinks that humans won't be able to understand, so he's contemplating to go to Nirvana instead. Is this story or fact? Well, Sister Jeanette from Manila. Sister Jeanette, whether it is story or fact, I won't be able to tell you because I cannot recall 2,600 years ago. And whether it is made by the narrators when they wrote down all this to try and include the gods of the Indian culture at that time, because it was Brahma Sahampati, that I do not know and I cannot answer. But it has become very much part of our culture. In fact, if I were to give a talk to a Thai center, somebody would chant the very words that Brahma that Brahma Sahampati have said, beseeching the Buddha to teach the Dhamma. And you will realize that for some Dhamma Dutta workers, they will not even share the Dhamma unless it is requested similarly by someone. So I am unable to answer your question, Sister Jeanette, as to whether that is a real event, but that is in the Vinaya. It is documented in the Vinaya. And I think that the lesson that I extract from there is that the Dhamma, the Dhamma that the Buddha realized is very profound. And you must remember the Buddha's words when he explained why he was reluctant to teach. And his words, which I will paraphrase, are that this is a generation that is very much emerged in sensual gratification sensual pleasures and a generation that is very very much interested in sensual pleasures sensual gratifications will have no interest for the dhamma and it is also the same when so many people in the last seven talks that i had give wrote but we had no time to answer why are my children not interested the answer is very simple your children have so much sensual gratification all their problems and worries are taken care of by Papa, that they do not see a need to get out of Dukkha. When you are in that situation, you will have no need to search for the Dhamma. And it will be almost very, very difficult to teach the Dhamma to people like that. And that was the reason the Buddha said. And of course, um, you will remember Bra uh, Brahma Sahampati's 
counter argument that there are some with little dust in their eyes. There are some who would have gone through this and be able to be receptive. And it is for those that the Buddha is teaching. So similarly, Sister Janet, Buddhism is not going to be a mass religion because it is too cerebral. I will put it very honestly, it demands too much thinking. The theistic religions just require, I believe, full stop, end of the story. And here in the Buddha Dharma, there is so much for us to learn that one can spend easily a few lifetimes and still not finish learning. All right, sister. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, thank you, Dalawong. Another question from Sister Colling. Why is legend in Buddhism strongly promoted? Well, I think the fault lies in the Dharma speakers. Some prefer legends than facts. I used to ask about a child Buddha, first day born and able to walk and say something. All the time, they never answer my questions. I felt very disappointed. To me, Buddha Dharma means truth, but nothing but truth. Yes. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Now, here I must share with you that I too have my difficulties trying to even convince the Dharma teachers in Johor Bahru with regards to this issue. Now, for many years, we had used the book printed by Sakya In, the notes, and I teased Brother Tan of Sakya In about this. And of course, Brother Tan told me that book hasn't been revised for goodness knows how many generations. And teachers tend to follow the book. Nobody wants to rock the boat. And so the book says, chapter this, this is what happened. So they teach the children, this is what happened. And as I said, that in the past, even within our generation, you know, we were very docile children. We accepted what is told to us. And I'm sure every one of us here who went to any form of religious class would have been told this and we just swallowed it like a fish, poke, stalk her and everything. But your children and my children and your grandchildren are different. My medical students will question everything. They are taught to challenge the teacher. No longer is the teacher's words literally the truth. So we have to change because any child now can just Google, consult Professor Google, and turn back and say, teacher, uh, why you say this? Uh, it is stated otherwise here. And then the teacher loses credibility. Okay. So yes, I think that one of the reasons is because people dare not rock the boat. People are following the paintings on the temple walls. And these legends have a nice story. I mean, if I will tell you, you know, the mother was crying, the father was crying, they were begging him, don't go, but he insisted on going. Nothing dramatic. But he would tell you there was this magic horse, you know, and this horse could leap over the wall, could jump open. I mean, the, the door mysteriously gates open and all the guards fell asleep. Well, that's very Steven Spielberg. But unfortunately, a smart child, like you, the sister who asked the question, would now face a doubt. And my big fear is that this doubt becomes extended to the actual teachings of the Buddha. That means now people do not see the difference between the legends and the teachings, which is why I said right at the very beginning, we have to be able to tell apart what is fact, what is the teachings and what is the legend. Now, like the brother who wrote to me, he began to have doubts because he said, look, this, this is no different from a theistic religion where I'm asked to swallow all the miracles. And being a very intelligent man, he simply could not accept those miracles. All right. So yes, sister, if you are going to make any difference, it's going to be a slow process because it is difficult. My wife is a Dharma teacher in teaching children. And she often discussed with me about these issues, which she find difficult because she knows what is in the Nikayas and yet the syllabus she's taught to, told, to teach tells a different story. Okay, thank you, Bobby. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wong. A question from uh, LYTO. Brother Puna Wong, the past Buddhists cannot be supported with historical facts. Can you comment on that? Brother, if I get kicked out of many Buddhist centers, I will have to come to your center. As I said, <laughs> Brother Ju Singh the other night asked me about controversies. I said for the last seven talks, I have said nothing but controversies. I'm 
might have to start applying to BGF for membership or so. <laughs> <laughs> You're most welcome. <laughs> Brother, do you know that in the Nikayas, in the Nikayas, there were only named by the Buddha six past Buddhas. Only six. From six, it grew until the Kuddaka Nikaya, which is a huge collection, a Chapalang collection of many, many things, to 20 over. And then it grew to the Mahayana 100 over. But the important thing is when you track this, you will see the exponential growth. And of course, being a smart man, you will have to tell apart what is very likely the truth and what is very likely embellishment. Nobody can prove the past Buddhas. We can't. Unless you are a mythic who can go into deep states of meditation and go back in the past and see them, it is beyond us. So I would suggest you form a file in your brain at the back of the hard drive called to be left alone. And just enter that data into that file until we have more information. Because at this point, no one can tell you. And there's no point debating or arguing about it because we are debating or arguing something metaphysical that can't be proved. But the Buddhist teachings are not metaphysical. The Dhamma is very, very real. All right, brother. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wong. And a question from Sister Su Wong. It was often described that the previous birth of the Bodhisattva was in the Tusita heavens. He waited in the heavens until a suitable time to descend to human realm to gain enlightenment. This implies that the Bodhisattva knew that he was going to gain enlightenment. It sounds so fated and as if he knew what full enlightenment is. Is there any mention in the Nikayas? Sister Su Wong, you have answered your question actually, you know. If you look at the context in which your question is phrased, you had already answered your own question. <laughs> because the answer lies in your own question. All right. Um, this story is very well beloved. You go to Burobudo, you will see this all literally cast in stones. All right. And as I said, these are all the biographies of the Buddha. I, I would categorize this particular uh, legend or tale like in the same class as the baby walking and deep proclaiming. Okay. It's very impressive in the sense that if this story was told to people 2000 years ago, it would be, wow, he must be a very powerful man. Wow, he must be really a great being. Wow, this must be a great being coming to do a great job. But you put the same message now to my PhD friend and he turns away from the Buddha Dharma. You have already answered your own question by the way you have text. I mean, by the way you wrote on that, uh, in, in the, the text that I'm reading right now. All right, sister. Thank you, Dr. Wong. And a question from Sister Eileen Tan. The legend is also prevalent in Mahayana. I suppose all this while the monastic is fully aware of such legend. If yes, why do the monks allow such legends to continue until today and no actions taken? I've always questioned such legends myself when I first started to learn Buddhism. However, no one seems to be able to provide an answer or dare to question this until today. All right. Again, sister, welcome to the club. You are not the only one now that you are aware of who is questioning such things. Sister, you must try and get the book in between the lines by Sister Sylvia Bay. It's a fantastic book. It's available free on the internet. All right, but I personally prefer the hard book. So I have the hard copy. In fact, I have a few copies of the hard copy, but I can't go to KL now because of the lockdown. You should read that book because that book addresses a lot of the very same question that you had raised. Why do people not question? One, because they don't want to rock the boat. Two, in certain lineages, they accept even the legends and the stories as factual. Even though they are written hundreds of years later, they accept it as factual. So it is only now with modern scholarship that people are saying, let's go back to the historical Buddha. And because you've got three main lineages, if you can find things which are common within the three main lineages, you are moving closer to the historical Buddha. What is found in one, not found in another, obviously occurred much later. So modern scholarship 
is helping us get closer to the words of the historical Buddha. And many, many of these stories, sometimes they don't even agree among themselves. I mean, story A and story B can be two different, slightly differing versions. Huh? But as I said, it's not important. When these stories were written, it has a moral lesson. That means they were not simply written. They were written with something in mind. But that something in mind could now already have lost its significance. And as I said, I discussed this with some Dhamma Dutta workers in Malaysia, and they said it's so much in common consciousness that he won't even bother to try and change it. At one point, I also say, okay, la, bia, la, how to change it? But the point is that now I begin to realize that the younger generation adopting the Buddha Dharma because their entrance or their entry to studying the Buddha Dharma is greeted by what they would call as something out of this world, something not consistent with rational thought. When what we tell people is that the Buddha Dharma is all about rational thinking, all about non-metaphysical things, things that you can prove. All right, sister? Or was it brother, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Another question from Brother Sui Kun. If you Google about the Buddha leaving his family, it is mentioned that he left in the middle of the night only. How do we find the true version? How would you describe Buddha? Uh, Dr. Wu, good evening. Now, if you Google, much of what you find on Google are based on the legends. Okay? And as I said, if you are really interested in the legends, quite a number of them are available free on the internet. You can, you can actually download the whole book, okay? And the legends, as I said, have lots of very nice, interesting Steven Spielberg effects, like living in the middle of the night. If you read the text that I put up just now about the Buddha leaving home, it does not mention whether it is the middle of the night or daytime. It only mentions about him leaving in full awareness with his father and his mother, literally crying their heart out. That is all we know. All right, it is not mentioned whether he left in the middle of the night or in the daytime. But what we do know is that none of that magic that you and I are familiar with is actually in the Nikayas. I had told the BGF uh, folks that please upload the slides that I had given to them as well so that those people who are interested, you can actually download it and then you can go and look at the references yourself. And as I said, do download Sister Silver Base book too, because uh, there's a lot of reference in there as well. There's another book which is called Buddhism for the Intelligent Man. Um, I do not know whether it is still in print. I bought it when I was in India about almost close to 20 years ago. But it also goes along this same theme of let us look at the Buddha Dharma, let us look at Buddhism devoid of all these metaphysical, supernatural, miraculous things, okay? You can try and Google that, Dr. Wu, Buddhism for the intelligent man. Yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Puna, we'll, we'll uh, put a link to your slides in the YouTube video afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, and a question from uh, Dukkha Kos. For a religion to be believed by laymen, normally they need to see some magic. Example, Buddha tame a wild elephant, or Jesus cure a sick man? Would it be true to a certain extent? Well, as I said, it is very, very much in almost all religions that the narrators would introduce this to show that my teacher was truly a great man, to prove superiority over the next person, to prove that he has spiritual attainments, etc., etc. These are very common and it, it cuts across not just Buddhism, but all, almost all religions. And this is something that the Buddha did not want. As I said, if you look at the Kevata Sutta, the Buddha quite obviously condemned it. And you know, I'm sure you are also aware of the story of how um, the Buddha's disciples were challenged to retrieve a sandalwood bowl put on top of a pole. And one of the monks actually did that, okay? And the Buddha scolded him. He was not praised at all. The Buddha scolded him that you must not do such things. And it is very interesting because the Buddha said that you do not teach people the Dhamma by such means. 
Because if people come to the Buddha Dharma because they are impressed by a magical act, then when they come and see Brother Bobby and me and Brother Bobby and me cannot do magic, then we are habisa. No one will listen to what we say already. So yeah. then that's where the man who sells snake oil is going to be very successful. The man who is going to do some little petty magic is going to be very successful. And the Buddha was against such methods. All right. But you're absolutely right, Brother Whaley, that this is a common theme across all religions using miracles to convince. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Another question from Brother, brother Sui Kwek. Sui Kwek. Are mudras really as taught by the Buddha or just a cultural creation? Mudra. Brother, absolutely cultural. Okay, not at all related to the Buddha. And they all serve educational purposes. Let me give an example. I often use this as an example. It's my example. This is the, yeah, this is the mudra of abaya. Okay, abaya means fearlessness, the gift of fearlessness. So this is the mudra, the mudra of abaya. So in traditional centers, you will see at the main entrance on one side, the Buddha put one hand like that. On the other side, the Buddha put one hand like that. And in the hall, sometimes both hands like that. And the Mudra represents fearlessness or protection. And so people will say, ah, that's the mudra of the Buddha giving protection, you know? And I often will ask when people ask me the same question, how does a bronze statue or a wooden statue or a stone statue with the Buddha putting up his hands and his palms facing forward offer you protection? Well, the protection is there. The protection is the Buddha is telling you, keep the five precepts. If you keep the five precepts, you are going to be very, very well protected. If you keep the 10 precepts, you're going to be even better protected. So that is my way of trying to share with people when people ask me, because this is a very common one that you see in the older centers. All right, but these are completely cultural. Okay, question from Tima Piao. Professor, can we confirm the fact that the Buddha was a son of a local chief and not a prince? Answer, yes. Historically, it is not a kingdom. Historically, it is a republic. And the people actually from among a council elected their own chief. All right. So he was not royalty. He was not a king. That's historical. And that's why he's from the warrior caste, the Kastriya caste. They were warriors who migrated from somewhere. Again, if you are interested, there are lots of literature on the internet with regards to this. And these warriors set up a small republic. It is supposedly the size of Belgium. To give you an idea of how big it is, it is supposed to be the same size as Belgium. And they are actually ruled overall by uh, Kosala. So they manage their own domestic affairs. And so he is not royalty in that sense. He is the son of a chieftain, okay? He is the son of our chief minister, for example, okay? Question from brother Niwan. With so many myths and legends surrounding the Buddha's life, we have been fed with so, and uh, got used to this fit diet, but this is not very useful for reality check. I personally find the bland version of the suttas more inspiring because I can relate to them. How can we change the narrative? Rather than even to change will require a lot of hard work and with great difficulty because it is in the common consciousness. However, as I say this, you will also realize that in the Western side, because they do not have the cultural baggage that we have, mm. they did not grow up with this diet you will find that more of the Western Buddhists are interested in the bland version of the sutra that you described. They are not very interested in the miracles and the legends. And their education system is such that they would have been taught to question such things 
right from the first day. And of course, just like my students that I teach, uh, we always tell them you have to tell apart what is legend, fact, and what is the truth. Malaysians will also move in that direction. And that is why I'm worried because our children are not going to swallow everything. They are an uh, internet generation, instant communication, whatever you say can be verified. So they will verify it. And then they can ask you teacher, this is not what is stated here. And the teacher loses credibility. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Another question from Dr. Wu. How would you describe the Buddha? Dr. Wu, as I said, I would, if I can go back 2,600 years now and look, what will I see? I will see a man, a teacher, who has trained himself very well, attained great insights into the realities of life and who has dedicated his life to teaching. There was no internet, no books, no paper, nothing. So the only way he could teach was to literally travel from town to town, village to village. And as he went from town to town, village to village with a group of disciples who are following him, he would stop at every village that welcomed him and teach. This is illustrated in the Kalama Sutta. He was going past the town, the Kalamas asked him questions, well illustrated. And he would travel from town to town and he would get food from the people in that town supporting him. And in centers, in villages, which are more established, he will stay for a longer period of time before he will move on. And the only time he stopped moving is during the rainy seasons, the Vasa, where he would spend it in one place. But he was a teacher who lived on arms, who moved almost nonstop, walked almost the whole of Northeast India and spent his whole life teaching. As such, I do not expect him to be a fat man like we will see in Chinese images because he would have been exercising like crazy. He's walking miles and miles and miles. And his diet, he only eats once a day. So you're not gonna be getting too fat on a diet like that. As a tra, he would have been obviously someone worn by the sun, dark, obviously as described in the suttas, bald. That curly hair that somebody asked came about in the 32 marks. Huh? In the suttas, he is described as bald. And you know, he was so strict with regards to the robes. So his robe would have been old, his robe would have been torn. And you know, in the Vinaya, he even specified how many times it must have been torn before you are allowed to change it. So you do not expect him to wear a robe that has all kinds of design, etc., etc. In short, Brother Wu, this is a man who is a teacher walking, who is very fit because of long distances, who is probably slim with little fat because of the diet that he's eating and who became old, lots of degenerative diseases and very likely finally died of a mesenteric infarct. All right, Brother Wu. Somebody wrote about the book, The Life of the Buddha by Venerable Nyanya Moli. Yes, that's a very good book. Unfortunately, the English is a, very, uh, it's a bit old because it's 1950s, 60s era, but that's actually a very good book, The Life of the Buddha by Bhikkhu Nyanya Moli. Um, almost without any of the miracles that you and I just discussed, okay? But it's a bit dry huh? because the English of that book is not the, the English today. And that is, by the way, how scholars try and date how old the suttas are. If you read Sutta Nipata, if you read Uda, uh, Udana, Iti Uttaka, Dhammapada, you will see that they're just lines. The Buddha said this, da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da. there's very little editing and narration to join it together. Okay, so they are very, very old. In contrast to Diganikaya, where you would describe, oh, he spent three months there, he stayed there, he said this. Somebody had to write all that in. Billy Tan says, uh, Question from Diva Piao. Professor, did the Buddha die of eating pork or bad mushrooms? Ah, if I can answer that question, it would be very good because it will stop all the controversy. 
Okay, you know that <clears throat> that word could mean either one. And so, of course, the vegetarians claim that it is bad mushrooms. The non-vegetarians claim it is pork. Uh, we do not know the answer. Okay, there is no way we will be able to find the answer. Question from Brother Billy Tan, I'll comment. The word Dharma is often mistranslated as truth, but the Buddha did not teach truth. The real meaning of the Pali word Dharma means experience. If people keep promoting Dharma as truth, it projects the impression that Buddhism is centered around blind faith, like many theistic religions. What is your opinion on this? The word Dharma comes from the root word D-H-R-D, which means to hold, something for us to hold to sustain, to maintain. And what, what was the other word already? Dharma was uh, to experience, yeah. Right, to experience, right, Bobby, you say? Yeah, experience. The word ehipasiko is to experience. Ehipasiko is not to come and see. Ehipasiko means to come and experience. That means you experience it yourself. Is this right or is this wrong? Dhamma is actually not with reference to the Buddha's teachings. The word Dhamma is already extant in the Buddhist time. So you can have uh, Mahavira's Dhamma, you can have any other teacher's Dhamma because it is their school of thought, their philosophy. So to be more precise, we actually have to clarify it by saying the Buddha Dhamma. All right, that means this is the Dhamma as taught by the Buddha. Okay, and you use the word truth. Of course, that's a uh, a, a bit difficult because what, what truth can have many, many meanings, you know. You can have relative truths, you can have absolute truths. Relative truth, for example, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. Everybody knows that. But if you go to the Himalayas, water will never boil at 70 degrees because it will probably boil at about 70 to 80. So that is what we call a relative truth. It is relatively true with regards to the conditions of that environment. And absolute truth would be the freezing point of water, for example, okay, no matter where the freezing point remains the same, etc. So um, it's going to be very difficult for us to be dragged into that discussion. But Dhamma, as taught by the Buddha, is with the big capital D, we call it Buddha Dhamma. If the small capital, the small word D is no longer the teachings, huh, but phenomena, that means small d, h, a, m, m, a, means phenomena. Okay, I think, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Wong, thank you for the wonderful sharing. I think uh, that's all the questions you can take for tonight. Otherwise, you'll drag on to 12 o'clock at night. Okay. So, uh, let's... The, the links to the, uh, the Sister Sylvia Bay's book is in the Facebook already. Wonderful. And I also put it in the YouTube video for, for your reference. And uh, Dr. Wong's talk will be uploaded to BGF YouTube tomorrow and uh, so let's end with a short sharing of merits. I'll share some screen now. Eta vata cha am hehi, sambatang punya sampadang, sabbe sata anumodantu, sabba sampati siddhiya. Let's do transference of marriage to our departed ones. Idame niati nang ho tu, sukita hon tu niata yo. Idame niati nang ho tu, sukita hon tu niata yo. Idam me niati nang ho tu, sukita hon tu niata yo. Let's uh, share some aspirations. By the grace of the marriage that we have accumulated, may we never follow the way of the foolish. May we be blessed with wise friends and skillful teachers who help us along the path of Dharma. Wherever we may be, until our final liberation, may we never stray from the path of Dharma. May we always have the chance to practice Dharma and one day realize the highest bliss of Nibbana. Okay. 
Thank you again, Dr. Wong, and to all the bedroom boys, uh, Alex Lim and uh, all the other guys in Bijia, and uh, all the participating Buddhist societies. So uh, <clears throat> I think this uh, sharing is very important because uh, as Dr. Wong mentioned, our future generations, if they can't believe us, they may even turn away totally from the Buddha Dhamma. So let's uh, start looking at things from a more realistic point of view. Okay, so thank you for joining in and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Good night. Good night. Thank you.